experienced or novice, able to make instant decisions in critical moments or lost. You're right about something. I pondered over the words of Grib and recollected in my memory many fates and biographies, right probably mostly, but that's how you recognize a soldier rather than a man. Not without reason people say about a pood of salt, which must be eaten before you make an unmistakable judgment about an acquaintance. Your saying may be true for peaceful life, but air combat is like many years concentrated into seconds, and not only years character will worldview. In the sky a man is like a palm in the palm of your hand. In life, people change. So we didn't agree on anything then, during the old argument at the Caponia. But decades passed, and I remembered that discussion many times. And I realized that in the end we were both right. The main thing is that we were not mistaken in the main in the inviolability of the desperate and beautiful flying brotherhood. Hundreds of letters that came to me from my comrades in arms after the war are the proof of that and among the great multitude of reflections, memories, circumstances touched upon in them, I would like to single out here lines from three letters. From the first one. I was brought together with different people on the roads of war, and among them the image of Vladimir Ivanovich Voronov remained especially dear and close in my memory. And who of us will forget his dashing attacks, calmness, endurance, imperturbability, and a beautiful soul, camaraderie? from the second. Dot, dot, dot. Isn't that Lieutenant General Voronov, Comrade Commander, who now commands the naval aviation of the Black Sea Fleet? Name and patronymic coincide Vladimir Ivanovich. If the one, you understand, did not lower the heights of our dear comrade. He was a fighter, fearless in the years of the Great Patriotic War. I think he will raise a worthy replacement for himself. But the letters of friends of the war years have a special property too much is contained in their subtext. Especially for someone who was a participant in the events described, and it would seem, dropped casually word consciousness and memory unfold into a voluminous picture. It brings to life sounds, voices, colours. Vladimir thought he was unlucky. During the battle for the Caucasus, he was ordered to protect the battleship Sevastopol from the air. The task, Nothing to say, important and necessary, not one air battle, had to endure a young commander. The Nazis were hunting for Sevastopol, and they even had a special order to destroy this malignant for them ship by all means. Voronov, in fact, was the eye culprit of that sad for fascist aces circumstance that this order was worth no more than the paper on which it was printed. Voronov's boys worked perfectly, and the battleship lived and terrified the enemy soldiers with volleys of its main caliber. There was Voronov when we met the commander of the link. He came to me before our relocation to the front and said, Will you take me to the regiment? What are you doing here? I'm guarding a battleship. No initiative. What initiative can there be if you're tied to the ship like a string? When you get the taste of battle, you warn yourself don't get carried away. Go back. You can't leave a battleship without cover. That's how we fight. It's no fun. I sympathized. It can't be much more fun. I liked this young pilot more and more. But I have all the positions of squadron commanders occupied. I looked at Voronov with a probing look. You misunderstood me, comrade commander. I'm not chasing ranks. I'm asking for a private pilot. But that's a demotion. I laughed. But I'll fight for real. My soul is hungry. Good then. We shook hands. A front correspondent who visited us soon wrote in the cockpit pilots those who once took their cars from Chersonese to the Caucasus. Are they the same? Their faces have become older. Many of them have sharp creases on their foreheads and lips. Are they the same? In the speed and slowness of takeoff, in the instant assembly over the airfield, in the confident march of the group that went to protect the attack aircraft, and not too experienced person will see the calm, alien to the fluctuations of power. Each pilot passed the test to the master and became a master himself. Here are flying over the airfield Voronov and Akulov. They are returning from Sevastopol. Both are young. They began their flying life during the war. Now Akulov, one of the most desperate in the regiment Avdiv, and Voronov does not lag behind him. This couple is connected by friendship. It is difficult to imagine one without the other. They are the favourites of the regiment. 
Guardsmen are proud of the pair Akulov Voronov. When I was asked how Voronov fights, I said this is a golden pilot. It is not without reason that his call sign is Falcon. Here he promptly enters the dugout. On his side, a tablet with a map. A gun. His leather jacket is open. Well, weather gods, are we flying? The gods are unfazed. Maybe we're flying, maybe we're not. Fog. What do they pay your salary for, Lieutenant? And how your miserable office doesn't go out of business? Trading in fog is a pre-planned bankruptcy. Everything is in God's hands, the lieutenant jokes angrily. Clearly it's all over, sold out. Cunning, you forecasters. As it is. Pilots urgently need this very clear. And Voronov especially. Yesterday in the battle he was shot through the plain plane. Voronov can't wait to get even, and he will get even. He will. Only if the weather doesn't let him down. In his heart, he slams the rough, chipped plank door and goes out of the dugout. Over the field there is an impenetrable gloom. Actually, the airfield is not visible. A white veil shrouded the sky and the earth and all things. Vladimir walked in this milk, remembering the details of the recent battle. He was returning to the airfield, when from above the clouds on him suddenly spiked two messes. In such a situation, death is almost inevitable no time to manoeuvre. The enemy has an advantage in height, speed, manoeuvre. Here could save only a lightning decision, and it is no accident someone jokingly called Voronov a mysterious device, where everything is already pre-planned. Of course, in aerial combat, resolutely nothing pre-planned simply impossible. But doesn't experience count? Is not courage and courage multiplied by character mean nothing? The device worked instantly, we must buy time, deceive them. It's a decent altitude, it should work. Do as I do. To the wingman. Yaks rushed down. The wingman looked anxiously at the altimeter the altitude indicator. It seemed that a few minutes more and the planes will crash into the ground. It took virtuoso skill to bring them out of the dive at extremely low altitude. And our pilots did. The messes have a lot of speed, and an airplane flying down a rock is a lightning bolt. If these Russians decided to be suicidal flashed, apparently in the minds of Hitler's pilots, then we do not have to join them at all. Probably, said Ben Struck by such an experiment wingman, in Voronov nerves, according to all the laws of nature, should exist. But I didn't notice them. But the Nazis freaked out, which the commander had hoped for they left the attack. In aerial combat, success is decided by seconds. Exit from the dive, turn, rapid climb, and here is already Voronov with the enemy on an equal footing. Now we'll see who's who, he shouted cheerfully into the microphone to his wingman, who was still shivering from the experience. Attack. The sky rumbled, coloured with cues, howled engines ready to burst from the tension. And in this frenzied merry-go-round, it seemed impossible to tail or aim. But for a moment a black cross was seen in the sight. Fingers triggered automatically there went the shells. Voronov did not even have time to notice whether he hit or not. Only coming out of the turn he saw a black plume of smoke stretched behind the plane, leaving in the direction of the German positions. And where the second messer went it is unknown. Probably dived into the clouds. Too bad we missed it. Messers attacked our bomber formation on the approach to the target. Voronov, as always, thought through the proposition, the attack he expected. Hitlerites, not idiots, and of course will try to repel the bombing attack. Attack in the forehead and from below, reason the pilot, is practically excluded. Here the fascists will run into a fairly powerful fire. Most likely, to they will pile up from above. Here they should be caught. Wait for a spurt of messes and intercept them at the very beginning of the attack but intercept them so as to be on their tail. They will not be able not to take the fight, it's too late, but they will no longer be to bombers. Our exit will be involuntarily accepted, but in a more favourable situation for the yaks. At first, this is what happened. Messers with a roar came out from behind the clouds and rushed to the target. The calculation of the Nazi pilots was simple first of all, to break the formation of machines, to sow panic, and then to hit the bombers one by one. 
Only a few moments separated the beginning of this assault from the seconds when Voronov and his wingman fell out from behind a neighbouring cloud. The messers noticed the danger when the yaks were already on their tails. It seemed that victory was assured the swastika was in the crosshairs. Voronov pressed the trigger and. The machine gun did not work. Something unforeseen happened. Probably a skewed cartridge. But precious seconds are lost messers are leaving on a turn. Now there will be a fight on equal terms, and everything must start again. And the bombers are already over the target. Below a sea of fire, explosions, black haze obscures the horizon. Voronov no longer hopes for a machine gun. Cover, I'm attacking. The wingman feels in the commander's voice an incomprehensible anger and does not understand anything well, not shot down. Not in every battle it succeeds. The main thing is dumb messers are not allowed to reach the target. They are constrained by the battle. Now everything is already by the rules in the sky carousel, where the uninitiated will surely confuse their own and strangers. Voronov goes head on. The Hitlerovite is not a coward. The glove is up the wingman is terrified now they will collide. I won't roll. Gritting his teeth, Voronov mutters to himself. No way I'll not roll over. I'd rather break my neck. Fiery trails stretch from the Nazi plane to the yak. Shoot, shoot. She won't help you. Desperate rage overwhelms the pilot. Now. In the last fraction of a second, the messer turns away. At the very instant when automatically triggered reflex Voronov and in the fuselage with a black cross cut into his shells. Only after a minute or two Voronov felt that his face back and palms of his hands seemed to be cramped. It's no good. Brother, he muttered unhappily to himself. Nerves are running wild. What did you say? In the earphones, the worried voice of the wingman. Are you hurt? Nerves, I said. What do we need nerves for? Where's the second fascist? I don't see him. He's gone. Well, fuck him for leaving. Watch the sky. I'm watching it. It's calm for now. It's not calm. It was unclear whether the commander was pleased or annoyed. Now about the third letter I mentioned at the beginning and received from a fellow soldier after the war. I was surprised by the courage and some uncharacteristic of young people, professional acumen Voronov. Already in the first flights when he was a wingman, he showed himself a determined, resourceful, strong-willed fighter. I will never forget the joy literally written on his face when he shot down his first enemy plane. He experienced unsuccessful attacks painfully, and then he did not sit on the ground. Give him the will he would all 24 hours would not come out of the fights. I don't know where he got his strength, but I never saw him tired. I thought he was young. No, it wasn't youth. We've travelled a long way together, and he's always remained the same. Of course Voronov's soul was young, and also stronger than that was a fierce desire to win. There were other lines in the letter, who else but such people to bring up a new generation of air aces it is difficult to add anything to such words. They involuntarily cause reflection. Pilots are different in character and soul. One is impatient, active, furious in attacks. He has an instant reaction to any battle situation. He is infinitely brave. He is so brave that sometimes he goes to the edge and he has to be corrected and reprimanded. Well, think about it. You'll kill your bright head, though you'll shoot down a fascist. What's the use? Bravery is not enough in war. You need stamina too. You must agree how much more useful you'll be if you win and survive. Then you will send not one, but a dozen Hitlerites to the grave. The boy agrees. But you can feel it's for appearances. Style of his combat work in the sky does not change. And there are masters of aerial combat. They also do not take courage but they will not let themselves be carried away by a false manoeuvre, will not give in to provocation. They are tacticians and, if you like, strategists. They are able to anticipate the operation so as to win the battle, even with minimal forces, and attack to build a competent, foreseeing fatal situations, and find a way out of the most seemingly hopeless situation. Vladimir Ivanovich Voronov was such an ace. It happens that a person you have known for a long time, quite unexpectedly reveals, it would seem, a small detail, a touch of behaviour. But it speaks about a person better than the most detailed descriptions. 
Once Voronov wrote in a letter home these lines. Dot, 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 the weather is excellent. You can sunbathe to your heart's content. Places you can't take your eyes off, such beauty all around. We live quietly well. And my heart is happy. We're heading for victory. So, not in vain we ploughed so many front roads and burned in the sky not one ton of gasoline. Our birds are glorious. I would like to bow for them to designers and workers. Our yaks are not afraid of any enemy. Yesterday I went swimming. So, as you see, there is no reason to worry about me. I live like at a country house. This letter came out from under his pen after the cruelest battle, in which he shot down a messer, and in which he himself barely survived the mechanics counted then on his car 48 holes. By May 9th, a select group of German aircraft in the Crimea was completely destroyed. However, there was still a threat of strikes by German aircraft from airfields in Romania, on the troops, cities and other facilities in the Crimea. Therefore, we fighters were tasked to carry out air defence of Sevastopol and the entire Crimean Peninsula. After the surrender in the Crimea, the fascists tried to launch an airstrike on Sevastopol and Simferopol, but without success. Enemy bombers were timely detected by the air surveillance, warning and communication service, and our pilots in cooperation with anti-aircraft gunners did not allow the air enemy to the objects. Three enemy bombers Heinkel 111 were shot down near Sevastopol. It was one more addition to those losses which were already suffered by Hitlerites in the Crimea. Only during the fighting for the Sevastopol bridgehead for six days the Nazis lost more than 20,000 killed and more than 24,000 soldiers and officers captured. 97 enemy tanks, 136 airplanes, 2588 guns and mortars, 4,737 automobiles were destroyed and captured. In addition, our aviation and ships of the Black Sea Fleet from April 8th to May 12th were sunk 191 enemy ships, including 69 transports and 56 fast landing barges loaded with troops and military equipment. Of this number, 120 ships were sunk by pilots, 41 by gunboats and 30 by submariners. The way from Sevastopol to Romania and Bulgaria fascists fearfully called the road of death. After the war, the beaten generals would start justifying themselves. Falsifying the events of the war with the Soviet Union, they acting as historians, all the blame for the defeat of German troops in the Crimea will begin to blame on Hitler, who did not dare to evacuate in advance the troops from the Crimea. General Tippelskirch, for example, is perplexed dot, 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 dot Hitler's order to hold Crimea, which was now 300 kilometers from the German front, was simply incomprehensible. Crimea was for Hitler only one of those already existing or planned outposts, which Hitler, under the horror of the German command in the East, ordered to hold at all costs. But who will be deceived by these writings? The back of the fascist beast was broken by the great, mighty Soviet army. The Crimean offensive operation, the final stage of which was the breakthrough of the Sevastopol fortified area, went down in the history of military art as one of the brilliant operations of the Great Patriotic War, conducted by the Soviet Army in cooperation with the Navy. In this operation, the 17th German Army was completely destroyed. The Crimean Peninsula was returned to the motherland, the Black Sea Fleet was able to operate in the entire Black Sea Basin and actively participate in the defeat of the Nazi troops in Romania and Bulgaria. The Soviet Air Force received good airfields for combat operations in the Black Sea Basin and the Balkans. After the defeat of the German fascist troops in the Crimea were released significant forces of our army, navy and aviation to perform new tasks for the final defeat of the hated German fascist troops. With the liberation of the Crimea radically changed the military and political situation in the south of our homeland. The process of disintegration of the fascist bloc intensified. At the end of June 1944, our regiment was relocated to a field airfield near Odessa. From here it was a short distance to vital centres and objects of the enemy. Our yaks were entering the operational space. Today it will cause a smile. But that morning, August 17th, 1944, I indulged in truly sorrowful reflections. The fact is that the regiment had recently received yak threes, really marvellous fighters for that time. Manoeuvrable, excellent in air combat and in the assault on ground targets. With them. Although they gave us so far a little, no messers and focus now were not afraid. But even the former modification yaks a formidable weapon. The pilots were eager to fight, 
and we really dreamed of meeting the air enemy. And then, just like that, a telegram from the Air Force headquarters, the whole regiment is to fly out. The goal, the destruction of enemy manpower and equipment in the area of Akamanti. To fly out, of course, we will fly out, I thought sadly. But is it a worthwhile endeavour for yaks? The headquarters could have offered us something more respectable. And so a boring job. But orders are not discussed. The regiment raised the alarm, and now the brown steps of Ackerman are floating under the wings, bright green islands are lush, August scattering of gardens, and only ruins in the place of towns and villages remind of the war. It seems a ghostly absurdity in this, so real and beautiful blue piercing summer sky. In a distinctly boring voice I give a command over the radio. Do not engage in small targets. No chasing single vehicles. Do not attack anyone without orders. As time went on, the mood got worse and worse. Indeed, as if they decided to laugh at us twice, we met quite large concentrations of enemy troops, but they were already being intensively processed by other air units. Maybe we can help. Indifferently asked the navigator, knowing the answer in advance. Why, I waved my hand, they will manage without us. Only twice was allowed to squadrons to attack, once a military column, the second a cluster of cars. They were over with soon enough, and again we continued our dull, joyless flight. I was about to give the command to return home, when suddenly I noticed a military echelon going at full speed near Ackerman. I took a closer look, the train was mixed tanks, equipment under tarpaulins, a few cool cars. It seems that this is what we need. Attention. I can feel my voice clearly cheered up. Attack the train. My squadron will begin. Second squadron will make a second strike. The rest of you, watch the air. Yes, sir. I'm throwing the car down sharply. I'm going straight for the locomotive first of all. The train must be stopped. The Yak's cannon and its machine guns are working. It seems to be a successful approach. A cloud of steam and smoke rose above the locomotive. The train braked sharply. Turn to the left, gain altitude. And I'm already watching the work of the guys. The fighters are fanning out. Some hit the head, others hit the tail of the train. Fascists jump out of the cars. Falling wherever in ditches at the railroad embankment in holes. Many fell down immediately, not having time to hide bullets from fighter planes did their job. I looked around, everything was all right in the air, so I can get in on the action. I choose a huge freight car in the middle of the train as a target and accurately go in on it. From a height of 350 to 400 metres I gave a cue. I don't know what was in the wagon. Apparently ammunition a terrible explosion scattered the train. My yak was thrown in the height and I immediately smelled gasoline. Comrade commander, the machine is damaged. Gasoline leaks from the tanks. We need to return immediately the voice of navigator Novikov calm. But behind this feigned calmness I can feel excitement. I know that in any, the most difficult situation Novikov himself will remain at his post until the end. He's worried about me. There's nothing to do, I'll have to pass the command to the deputy. The machine is damaged. I'm going to the airfield. Continue the assault until the train is completely destroyed. I turn the car around, look around. Hawks finish the job, cars explode and fly off the embankment. Even the step near the railroad bed is ablaze with orange flames. Yeah, the mechanic hummed uncertainly, inspecting the machine at the airfield. I wonder how you made it with empty tanks. Hell knows how it could have ended. And you, he turned to me, but do not be sad. I'll have your horse repaired in two days. It'll be as good as new. Yak rolled to the shelter. In the evening there was a debriefing of the operation. Someone contributed his share of self-criticism. You shouldn't have come at such close range. And who knew Novikov objected, that the carriage was stuffed with explosives. Everyone agreed. Indeed. In war as in war. And on a boring job can lose your head. However, in the evening it didn't seem so boring to us anymore. I had a strange feeling on that flight. The reason for that was the morning and the sea. The sun was shooting out myriads of fiery splashes from the still water surface. The golden fog over the shore was melting, 
crawling away into the white limons of the prides, and over the whole step from edge to edge there was a ringing, incomprehensible silence. And even the roar of starting fighter planes was not associated with the war. It was as if somewhere in the 39th or 40th on the green field of Tushin Sport high-speed machines were flying off into the heights. Something shifted in my soul. Everything had an impact the access to the state borders, and surprise I went through such hell circles, and stayed alive and the joy of victorious reports from the fronts, and the feeling of happiness that victory is not far off. No, we did not deceive ourselves. We knew that there was still blood and loss ahead, and not all of us would come home. But in the war you can't live only with sorrowful thoughts. Life is life everywhere. And we were young. That's why we couldn't deny our optimism. And this despite the fact that we gave ourselves a clear report that those of the Nazi pilots who survived in Sevastopol or over the Kuban, so for good living, will not give up at the end of the road. And the goal is close, and the dawn is close, and the long-awaited peace, where guns do not beat and heavy bombs do not burst every minute. I even dreamed of this other, so far unreal life, when the airfield was left behind and our cars lay on a combat course to the shores of Romania. I will go to study, I thought. First, of course, I will rest. A good rest. I'll go somewhere on the Volga, or to the Black Sea. The Black Sea, of course. I did not imagine it calm, with golden bays of beaches, with the murmur of waves, not airplane engines, without the black smoke of the burning Sevastopol panorama, without the rumble of fighting over two apps. I'll have to get used to it, I grinned. However, is it difficult to get used to the beautiful? Hawk. I'm Wave. Can you hear me? I'm Hawk. I hear you fine. We're approaching the target. Should we split up? Lukinsky's voice in the earpiece. I'm looking at the horizon. I think Lukinsky's right. The first wave of planes will hit the piers from behind the hills. Just in case we should cover it from the city. We didn't expect serious attacks by messers, but a surprise attack by even two or three experienced aces can be costly. Cover the city. Yes, sir. Cheo. I see how Lukinsky and his wingmen break away from the armada of cars and take the Morister. They'll approach the target from the left. Stand by. Throw the plane forward. Float under the wings of the beaches, some buildings. But here long ribbons of piers, a forest of masts. We see how the sailors are obviously fussing. A small tugboat is pulling transportation to the exit from the bucket of the port. Signers, like beetles, spread out in different directions. It's clear disperse. Yak shakes sharply, and immediately hundreds of multicolored tulips blossomed across the blue sky anti-aircraft gunners opened fire on our aircraft. White, green, red trails stretching towards us. Attack. The roles we have distributed in advance, and only to the uninitiated it seems that the armada of machines collapses chaotically and haphazardly. The mushroom is hitting the batteries. I take on the ships. Not a minute passes below is a sea of fire. From the black clouds of smoke fly to the sky some shapeless pieces of iron, mangled steamer pipes, broken masts, second run, a third. I can't make out the targets. In the eyes one roaring and devouring flame. Reverse course. The command has to be repeated several times. Passionate pilots do not immediately understand what they want from them. Suddenly out of the torn clouds of smoke appears Yak Lukinsky. In the headphones rattles his voice. Why home? There's still plenty of ammunition. We'll go back over the roads. I see. I'm looking at the line of vehicles. I'm trying to count them. I don't see any casualties. Good. The boys have learned to fight. The Sevastopol arithmetic and numerous bruises and bumps received by young people due to inexperience came in handy for them. The steppe seems deserted. Down below, like a patchwork quilt, narrow scraps of peasant land, so different from our boundless collective farm fields, ironing the air for ten minutes. The search seems to be fruitless, nothing worthy of our attention. But what is it? On the road, wriggling, crawls a giant caterpillar. I'm coming down. I can see wagons, tanks, cars with soldiers. Apparently they noticed us the trucks are rushing into the steppe. 
Soldiers jump out on the ground, looking for potholes and ravines. Horses are neighing. We're passing over the ground almost at a soaring angle. I've got a car in my sights. I press the trigger, a burst of fire, clouds of blue-black smoke. I break out of this chaos, repeat the approach, and only now I notice the guns. They've been pulled back to the shrubbery. Now we need a particularly precise work. I squeeze the knob so that the engine's shudder is transmitted, it seems, to the very heart, as if I and the machine were one and the same. I'm firing the cannon. Guys support with Irasami. On the turn I look back broken carriages, mangled barrels. Wheels scattered on the ground. When we took a course to the east and there was not enough fuel left in the gas tanks just to reach the airfield, I noticed a hole in the wing. So a stray piece of shrapnel did not miss me after all. But in war, shrapnel that passed by the pilot himself doesn't count. If the machine is obedient, if the engine is singing, everything is all right. That means we'll fight again. Well, what will you do after the war, Mikhail Grigorievich? Mikhail Grigorievich blushes. He's not used to being addressed by his first name and patronymic, yet only yesterday he passed his twenties. The burden of decades doesn't weigh on his shoulders, and the school name Mishka hasn't been erased from his memory yet. Then I don't know. I was thinking of going into architecture. Not a serious specialty came a voice from the corner of the dugout. After the war we'll need builders, engineers. How many bridges, factories, cities we'll have to build? And you're going into architecture. And he'll be forcing himself in front of the girls. Laughs Grib. He will get acquainted with this thin-legged and attack. So-and-so. What are you interested in? What are your cultural needs? What kind of books do you like with this special approach? The girl, of course, melts from such a lofty treatment. And he, by the moment, throws and I am, by the way. An architect, in a word, the kinship of souls is revealed. And the matter began. Mushroom is clearly pushing. The challenge is suddenly taken seriously. Builders. And what will these builders build? Houses, hospitals, schools. Who will design them for us? The Pope of Rome? No, brothers. After the war, the country will need architects badly, like air. All right, go ahead and go to the architectural school. I'll go to the land, to my place in the Volga region. I'm hungry for the land. If you close your eyes, there's a wall of wheat from horizon to horizon, and a lark in the sky. And in the morning, the field waves in the wind like the sea. And the sun from behind the nearest forest is like a glowing disc. You'll live to see that sun. We haven't reached Berlin yet. And I will. I have no right not to. I have two boys at home. One writes that he's already mastering the tractor. I don't know how he's mastering it. He went to the front when he was just over ten years old. And he's already a breadwinner. Or does more than that I joined the conversation. People grow up early nowadays. You don't say, comrade commander. Mikhail Larionov moved closer to the smoker made from a shell casing. Recently I received a letter from my people. Here's what they write. Vasily Ignatik had lived in Kiev for a long time, and his speech was equipped with Ukrainian words dear to his heart. The boys drew closer to the fire. It is incomprehensible how the word letter worked then. A letter from there. A letter from a thousand kilometers away, from relatives, even if not yours or friends, but all the same, as if it became warmer in the dugouts, and the battles as if for a while retreated beyond an invisibly distant limit, and the soul was renewed, as if our wives, mothers, and children entered this circle, outlined by the yellow light of the soldier's smoker. My dear Valsenkar, Vasily Ignatich began, ran his eyes over a few words, blushed and blanched. Well, it's nothing special here. It's personal. The boys laugh. It's clear. Love. Kisses a thousand times. Go on. My dear Vasyanka, we already know you're dear. You're cunning, Ignatyach. You're putting a price on yourself. What are they writing about? Our collier has gone to a trade school. He's always missing at the factory. In a month, he'll be making the things you need at the front. He's lost a lot of weight, but I guess it's an age thing. Nadinka and the girls are in the collective farm. She helps on the farm. In three months she's been home twice. She's far away, and the work won't let her go. I've retrained myself. When I think about what's happening to the country, I feel bad. I couldn't sit in the office anymore. 
filing and mailing papers. Any girl could do it. You know that I'm very good with medicine. Remember how you fought me off when I treated you for a cold? There was laughter in the dugout again. Looking at Matveyaks's mighty figure, it was hard to suppose that such a rich man could ever have had the flu, and compared to what made up our daily routine, those pre-war peaceful illnesses seemed something childish, frivolous, unreal. The war had run people ragged. We froze in the frosty evenings. In the pouring rain they did not leave the airplanes for hours, and nothing, no sickness took them. Probably some psychological barrier developed. A wound is a wound. There's nothing you can do about it. And the flu, I guess there was flu too. But somehow we managed with improvised means. We didn't go to doctors. Matvaych smiled himself, remembering perhaps something infinitely dear and sweet. Will you listen, you devils, or I won't read it? No offense. We're just looking at your build. It's a good build. Listen further, so that's where I ended up. Cured a cold, I went back to work at the hospital. As a nurse, it seems to be closer to you. People come from the front. They tell me a lot of interesting things, but I've never met anyone from your unit, no matter how many times I ask. Maybe it's for the best. It means you don't have many wounded. Maybe they're sent to other hospitals. That's how we live. We seem to be one family, but we don't see each other much. I'm often on night duty. My eldest is at the factory, my daughter at the collective farm, and you're at the front. I wish that damn Hitler would get his neck snap. There's a big map on the wall next to the buffet at home. We rearrange the flags on it after every report from Savinform Bureau. It makes me feel better now. The flags go to the west, and when you look at the map you get scared. After all, all the way to the Volga, the whole map is pinned with pins from the flags. How much we had to endure. We remember you every day. We love you. Mateusz faltered. Well, it's not about you again, you loudmouths. All you want to do is laugh. But no one said a word. Everyone was silent for a long time. Only after a minute or two did Grib quietly remark. And after all, they are not easier than us be. Of course, sometimes we risk our lives. But the whole country takes care of us. Airplane, please. Rations, please. Uniforms, please. And what it's like for the mothers now. And the boys, that's how it is. Boys sharpen shells and assemble airplanes. Mushroom actually said out loud what each of us thought at that moment. You've upset my soul, Mateusz. The captain got up from the bench and headed for the exit. I'm going to have a smoke. I'd better go too. I took the clipboard. I need to write a letter home. Mushroom shivered. How are they? And everyone wanted to be alone at this moment. But I'm going to the architectural school. Misha, pensive, thinking about something of his own and was now far away from this dugout and from everything that awaited him behind its walls. The next morning they left for the mission and did not return. Neither Mikhail, who dreamed of architecture, neither Volodya, whose son somewhere in the distant Volga region, replaced his father on the collective farm field. It was only their second combat sortie. War is merciless. It does not count with human dreams, and the heavier the bitterness of loss is how many talented musicians and poets, architects and engineers never joined their vocation. Creativity. Duty forced them to choose other specialties. Pilots, motorists, technicians. Another military labor fell to their hard share, and they did it with all the heat of their souls. They gave everything to it to the end, mind, strength, inspiration, talent, we could not do otherwise. It was decided whether or not to be the most sacred thing for everyone. In the morning there was a fresh breeze from the water, and now it is quiet, not a single twig on the trees does not move. They were guarding the attackers quite well, but still Messers managed to get through to the armada. Three of our cars, burning, collapsed to the ground. In war there are no losses without losses, but you still cannot get used to them. Pain and bitterness every time so sharp, as if this happens for the first time. The golden moon sticks out in the sky. The song is quietly coming from the Caponia to the accordion. Judging by the voices, it's Captain Gribbs' guys. The motive is soul-pressing, familiar from childhood. The sea is wide open. But the words are different. Those that were born in besieged Sevastopol. The sea is wide open. By the Crimean native shores. The mighty Sevastopol lives. Ready to be resolute. And the breast of Sevastopol covered the native Sevastopol. Sailor, infantryman and pilot. 
by the strong wall of steel defence. A raider will find his grave here. Several young strong voices pick up the melody, and it grows stronger, gaining strength. We've seen cold and cold in battle. We've gotten used to the rain and the winds. We'll slay the fascists in battle. And we know that victory is ours. So bravely, friends, to our decisive battle, so that the whole human race may rise up, so that no one can ever again, so that no one else can make a bandit's raid on our country. What can I say, homemade words? But what to do? At the front we often have to make do with our own words, and it's not a problem that it's unprofessional, but everything that is said in the song is said from the heart. As much as we tried to find out who composed these words, we could not get anything good. The author is nameless, but perhaps it is great. If the song is loved, went all over the Black Sea, it means that it responds to what is going on in our souls. And everyone puts his own subtext to it. And today, the guys are singing, but for sure they are thinking about those who forever remained lying there, on the Crimean land in shortened and burnt mud, and also that they will avenge them. There were not many of them, only twelve men, sitting glumly at the caffeineer. Silence dragged on, because no one knew what the first word should be. But here rose the deputy commander, Captain Zubkov, and with a decisive wave of his hand, quietly threw. There is nothing to talk about here for a long time. The question. What question? Let's write it down like this. Minutes of the general meeting of the squadron. The agenda is also clear. To avenge the death of our Komsomol leader, Igor Vasilievich Gra Start. That's right. There were cheers of approval. This protocol, no. One has been preserved. I will cite it in its entirety as the brightest evidence of the thoughts that we lived. 1. To avenge the Nazi invaders for the death of our combat secretary of the Komsomol organization Gromov Igor Vasilievich. Listen to the deputy commander for political part, Captain Comrade Zubkov. Comrade Gromov had 113 combat sorties. He fought against the fascist barbarians on the Leningrad front. From there, he was transferred to our unit. Comrade Gremov, during the war, participated in the defense of Sevastopol and until the end of his life crushed the enemies of our motherland. Comrade Gremov was an advanced organizer of Komsomol work. Personal combat example showed Komsomol members how to fight. By this example, he rallied around him Komsomol members of his organization to take revenge on fascist invaders for Comrade Gromov, to show themselves honest and fight as Gromov fought. Sveikix. Tchukovsky. I have known Comrade Gromov almost since the beginning of the war as a good comrade, as a combat secretary and organizer. I swear before the Komsomol members that until the end of my life I will avenge our combat secretary Comrade Gromov. Plitin. Comrades Komsomol members, this is the first meeting at which Gromov is not present. Not only Gromov died from the fascist hand. Millions of innocent Soviet people died at the hands of these enemies. Let us swear, comrades, that we will mercilessly avenge our friend. The Nazis will pay with hundreds of their soldiers for our secretary. Comrades, I propose to write a slogan on one of the combat plans. Let's avenge the fascist barbarians for our combat secretary, Comrade Gromov. Resolve. Having heard the report of Captain Zubkov about the heroic death of the crew of Senior Lieutenant F. Steifev, which included the secretary, Lieutenant Gromov, the general Komso meeting expresses deep sorrow on the occasion of the death of our secretary and friend. Cursed Hitler's brigands tore out of our ranks a brave fighter and authoritative leader, devoted communist to the end, secretary of the Komsomol organization. Let us swear to avenge the death of our comrades. We will beat the enemy as accurately as Gromov. Let's keep the bright memory of him in our hearts and carry it as a banner of deadly hatred of the enemy, as a banner of final victory over the enemy. The Komsomol meeting proposed to write a slogan on one of the combat plans. Let's avenge Comrade Grom. They voted in silence, silently and went away. And in half an hour their cars were already turning out fire. I did not envy those fascist pilots who would meet them in this flight. The sun was burning mercilessly. Grasses withered and the whole field turned ashy whitish color. Even airplane fuselages seemed to be red hot. Dural burned fingers. The only saving shadow is under the wing, but how can you hide under it if you are not one, and not two? Our uniforms were soaked, large drops of sweat on their faces. Let's get started. Captain Demidov gestured to Lieutenant Nushin. Give me the map. The map is laid out right on the ground. 
helped the pilot sit down in a circle. Such eagles, Demidov's voice is full of concern. This time the assault is serious. We'll hit the ships in the waters of the Danube. Here and here the pencil flies rapidly on the map. What do we know about the anti-aircraft defences? There's a battery near the hills. That's certain. But it's also certain that such objects as the Danube are not protected by one battery. So we'll see something else. Camouflaged and therefore probably not detected. Any other questions? There will be questions on the spot. Nushin is getting up from the ground. But we'll have to solve them ourselves. You consult with Hitler. Goring as a last resort. I tried. They don't connect. They're bastardized, the bastards. I'll complain to them personally, when I get to Berlin. That's right. Get them in order. Now today we'll start putting things in order. Davidov smiled. It's good that the guys are in a good mood before the flight. And the jokes? It's not carelessness. You can't do without jokes in their business. There's enough grief in war. You guys are responsible for the attack planes with your heads. And we always use our heads. The heavily laden attack planes took to the air. In a matter of seconds, the Yaks took off. They lined up in battle order. Fighters this time led Lukinsky and Kolograd. Under the wing gleamed the wide surface of the Danube. Where have the ships gone? Lukinsky thought anxiously. Hmm, chief, look, they've disguised themselves at the piers. He is Kologravov's voice in the earphones. Lukinsky himself already distinguishes patrol vessels, boats, barges. A dredger wedged into them with a clumsy trunk. Begin just dropped. The first wave of stormtroopers passes over the edge of the coast. And all at once, explosions, fire, smoke. Watch the air. Lukinsky knows that Kologravov can't wait, but they agree to attack one by one. Of course, if the messes don't show up, three barges are on fire. It was Davidov stormtroopers. Lukinsky hits the boat. It bursts into flames. The Nazi anti-aircraft gunners came to action, but not for long. Here over their battery explosions went off. Well done, Kologravov. He thankfully thinks Likinsky. At the right time hit, the second six Ilov, which led Nuzhin, is already going to the target. The dredger suddenly begins to smoke and in a moment throws out a high sheaf of sparks. Burning boats sprawl on the river. From their sides jump into the water soldiers, who attack the boats. Lukinsky can't help himself. Well done. Young people, in the voice of the presenter, Pride, Sandbatilov, Eremin, Ivanov, Babia. It's time to go home. It seems to be done. The planes are turning away from the Danube. There are no nameless attack planes. Behind them is a feat. Behind them are the names of heroes. Here they are, Lukinsky, Kologravov, Davidov, Nushin, Ivanov, Eremin, Novikov. Shakirov, Kosikin, and only still beginning their martial labor, Alexiev, Ponomarev, Kozlov. This is their work. Two BD were badly damaged, destroyed up to a hundred enemy soldiers and officers. After the first approach, a large transport standing in the port, a boat and a barge of the enemy were set on fire by direct hits of bombs. Four big fires broke out on the shore. That's how our revenge went on the land, for comrades burned in the sky. For the ruins left behind, for the ruins of liberated cities, for the immeasurable grief of the people. Friends of Komsorg Igor Gromov did not throw words to the wind. Wherever our airplanes passed, they carried on their wings retribution. The leader of the second pair, Nikolai Petrov, left the battle at its very beginning. The cannon line of the Messer cut the gas tanks. The attack aircraft burst like a torch. Fortunately, the pilot managed to eject by parachute. Later, he said, you covered us well, I saw it myself, I don't count. Such assaults without losses do not happen. But I'm talking about something else. It was that rare case when a pilot from the ground observes the actions of his comrades in the air. But how come you weren't captured? You landed right next to the convoy we were storming? It was just luck. The wind blew me into the shrubbery at the very ground. And Hitlerites, you understand, did not care about me. Each of them thought only about his own skin. They scattered on ditches and roadsides, fell down and looked, of course, in the ground, not on the sides. Of course, I would have been, to put it mildly, upset if they had rushed to the bushes and bumped into me. Then I'd have to say goodbye to life a second time. But they didn't have time to run to the bushes. We, or rather you, he corrected himself, we are already tearing up the road. There was no time to run. And you? What about me? 
I had a gun in my hand. I can't go with it to help the stormtroopers. What would I do with that flare gun? Well, I'd shoot one German, and the other one would have spotted me right away. But even this I could not do. The fire from the air was murderous. Everything was burning and going to hell. If I had taken a dozen steps, I would have ended up with the Nazis in the other world at the gates of God. What did it look like? Ugh, I don't want to remember. Frostbite on my skin. First the head and tail of the column were covered, the cars were chopped to pieces, and the armoured tractors overturned. A traffic jam. Germans neither forward nor backward. The surviving trucks and cars threw the ditches into the field, and the ditches deep. Half of the vehicles stalled. That's when you came in for the second time. Yeah. I've never seen anything like it from the air. Everything's on fire, collapsing. Splinters, splinters of broken bodies and some kind of iron whistling in the air. It's a concert. Everybody's lying down. You can't tell who's dead, who's alive. Only one officer stood there for three minutes shooting his gun into the sky. What for? I marveled. He was not going to shoot down airplanes. And I thought, for what? He was probably crazy. Nerves gave out. He didn't realize what he was doing. What happened to him? Either a bullet or a piece of shrapnel. He jumped up somehow and hit the ground with a log. Mile, how did you manage to get away? I didn't have to think of anything. As soon as you deigned to leave, such a mess arose that not a single man, a company, would not have been noticed. The survivors on the highway and the side of the road to the west, so by some miracle two trucks survived. They're so battered I think they'll fall apart on the way, and everybody was looking up at the sky in fear to see if you'd show up again. So you did a good job. But still, how did you get here? I'm fine. It's not the 41st now. I sat in the bushes for an hour to be on the safe side. Then I crawled out and headed east. I walked at night as a precaution. I came across a peasant with a horse. At first he was frightened, thinking I was German. I had to explain myself on my fingers. We understood each other. He gave me as long a ride as he could. I sat down during the day and at night I went on the road again. Three days passed like that. Then I saw tanks. Aren't they fascist? I took a closer look. Our T-34s, the implonic lines of reports of those days, recorded the fury and tension of pilots' work. Rarys, a result of two strikes, two guns, twenty wagons with troops and cargoes were destroyed. Two dugouts were destroyed, several fires were caused and up to fifty soldiers and officers of the enemy were killed. Stiters were active on enemy communications. Ten fighters made a bombing attack on enemy troop concentrations. The next day, 22 fighters from a height of 1,500-2,000 meters stormed enemy troops and equipment in the area of Zalikar Shagini. As a result of the strike, 17 vehicles, 60 wagons and more than 100 soldiers and officers were destroyed. Guardsmen from the Shaving Flight 1, after another unexpectedly unleashed a hurricane fire of cannons and machine guns on the enemy tugboat, the tugboat, set on fire by aptly aimed bursts, caught fire and crashed into the shore. These are only three ordinary assaults. And how many there were? Once the scouts returned from a mission indignant and irritate. We are losing guys in battles, and they arranged a resort there, as if there was no war. Swimming, sunbathing. Who organized the resort? I was surprised. Who is sunbathing? Germans, comrade commander. What Germans? Where? The most ordinary ones we passed at a low angle, no attention. Cackling, having fun, boating, apparently they're fishing for crayfish on the frontline river, and on the lakes between the sea and the hills. It really hit a nerve, I went to the map. Show me. Here, yeah. the lieutenant drew a blue river spiral, and here, the pencil marked blue circles and ovals lakes. So many cars will it take for them to stop catching crayfish, and show them where the crayfish overwinter. Zero tree, we think, would be enough. All right. To the plains. Our yaks appeared over the heads of Hitlerites, unexpectedly spiked from the sun. Indeed, the picture that opened up to us was truly idyllic. Someone was swimming sprawlingly in a crawl. Someone was resting on his back. Soldiers were splashing and pouring water on each other. On the shore, covering their faces with newspapers, a dozen or three men were sunbathing. The uniforms were lying nearby, on the rocks. In a word, a Sunday beach of a resort town, and now we will sunbathe for you. And then the water surged with fountains. Boats were crashing and sinking. Vacationers were blown off the beach like the wind. 
Naked, they fled in terror along the slope, looking for the smallest notches in the ground to hide from the merciless fire that rained down on them from the sky. Later in the monium, Bathers rush to the shore, but rarely anyone reaches it. One approach, second, a third I look down it's all over. It's the corpses of soldiers and officers everywhere, and if anyone survived, lying immovable, afraid. We're making our last run, already so to speak, mental, almost above the ground. Now we can go home. Hitler's command lost more than a dozen soldiers that day. You will ask, how do I know these details, describing the events that will be discussed below? Even in those cases when I do not name myself or the pilots of our regiment, we were not outside observers of these events. Our yaks went side by side above below, on the flanks of the attacking armadillos. And on the day when the military facilities in Feradosha turned into a giant blazing fire, and in the black hours of Constance, and in the pitch black ode that unfolded over Sullen, Ackerman, Teplitz. As Hitler's General Manstein writes in his book Lost Victories, Hitler ordered, at whatever cost, to hold Crimea in his hands. The enemy Hitler declared must not get the Crimea, which he is using as a springboard for Russian air action against the Romanian oil fields. But we used Crimea too, and the steppes of Odessa, and we not only reached the oil fields, we reached them with our own persons. The commander of the 13th Air Division, Korzunov, called the head of the political department, Colonel Bozenko and Colonel Engineer Gruzdev at two o'clock in the morning. Why such a rush? Perplexed Victor Gruzdev, throwing on his shoulders leather flight jacket. Everything seems to be going normally, or maybe something has happened. Anxiety was already beginning to creep into his heart. Korzunov, it seems, did not go to bed at all. Outwardly, he was the same. A thick mop of hair, thin, slightly tired face, deep-set eyes under thick eyebrows. He was pacing back and forth in the wide room, twirling a pencil in his hands and apparently thinking something painfully. At your command, A.A., Gruzdev began, Stand down. Nkozunov waved his hand. There's no time for formalities now. There are more important things to do. Kozunov had a map of the Black Sea on his desk. Sit down, eagles. The commander gestured his combat assistants to the map. We need to think about something, and think seriously. Korzunov went to the door, tightly closed it and returned to the table. For a minute the commander was silent. So, brothers, the moment has come, which we waited for almost the entire war. In the 20th of August, the second and third Ukrainian fronts will go on the offensive. This is not a simple offensive. The defeat of Hitler's group Southern Ukraine the complete liberation not only of Ukraine but also of Moldavia, and more than that, a deep invasion of Romania itself. We are instructed to strike military facilities in Sulin and Constantia. Borzenko and Gruzdev sat stunned. But the P2s will not make it there and back, who Gruzdev began to think aloud. There would not be enough fuel. And the fact that they did not express enthusiasm about what they had just heard was natural. They had a kind of working style. Joy, joy, but you need to immediately, as Korzenov liked to say, take the bull by the horns and think over the case. It is clear that they won't make it, but it is necessary that they will. This is your concern. Korzunov looked at Gruzdev with a smile. Except for additional gas tanks, Gruzdev continued to ponder. You see, you are already becoming an innovator, Korzunov laughed. In general, the task is clear to you. Go think it over with the guys. Remember one thing, deadlines, and I still need to talk to the commissar. When Gruzdev left, Korzenov sat down next to Borzenko. Yeah, here's what's going on, commissar. You understand, you can't do it with gasoline alone. For Gruzdev, I'm calm. His devils will think of anything when necessary, and the pilots won't go off course. Now they're flying on the wings of victory, pardon the high-sounding language. Even to the end of the world, they will get to the end of the world. He was quiet but we don't need unnecessary sacrifices. We need people to fulfill the mission and return to the airfield alive. With the attack of Constanta, the war does not end. Every pilot is important to us. On my line, I've already outlined something. Korzenov looked into a notebook. Here first, he will conduct tactical exercises. Second, every pilot must know by heart the plan of Constanta and Sulina. Third, Mekonazusa, we must know their air defense system down to the last detail. Fourth, no. Korzenov listed point by point, then suddenly stopped and said without any transition. 
Perhaps this is the most important party assignment for us, Commissar, and not only ours and yours. Everyone's what are you going to do? All political commissars to the airfield tomorrow, to talk to every man. Good idea. And who will you send to the main airfields? Alexander Makarov, Mikhail Zubkov, Alexander Kozhevnikov. He listed names and surnames for a long time. There was no need to characterize them. Korzenov knew these wonderful communists perfectly well. Their word was trusted in the units as the word of the party. In the regiments we will hold party and Komsomail meetings. This is self-evident, he interrupted him suddenly, Korzenov. And what if you and I also to make an address to the personnel? Absolutely. Borzenko liked the idea. Let it reach everyone's heart. What a great flight the party is taking us to. On the night of August 20, Borzenko could not sleep. The sun had not yet risen, only the distant horizon in the steppe shone with a cold streak of dawn. A heavy fog was spreading over the land in blue flakes. Ah, oh, shit, I'm not going to sleep anyway. The chief of the political department got up, smoked a cigarette and went out to the airfield. At the outermost P2 noticed a group of people. I'm not the only one not sleeping this night, my smush through my brain. Although the pilots we ordered to sleep. Tomorrow they have a hard job. What are they doing up there? A mechanic stepped away from the fuselage of the bomber. Sasha Ivanov thought Borzenko. Exactly, he. How, comrade colonel? Ivanov asked and nodded toward the airplane. The white oil paint had not yet dried on the side of the machine. Forward for the motherland, read the commissar. Perhaps for the first time such an armada of airplanes, the 317 machines, worked according to such a brutally precise schedule. In the afternoon of August 19, Sulina, Constanta and Fedonisi Island shuddered from the bombing. The ships at the berths of Sulina port and the port itself were burning. Not having time to take off, Mesh and the airfields, named in Hitler's documents as Shield of Constanta, turned into a pile of smouldering scrap. The batteries of the island of Fedonisi took to the air. Tears to Sinsuli and Constanta, when night approached, thought that these strikes were the end. But they were only the beginning. The 23rd Nicholas Regiment replaced the 5th Guards Regiment. In the commander of the 5th Guards Air Regiment, Mikhail Birkin told me three days later. Now, can you imagine, namesake, what we had going on in the evening? Frankly speaking, we were used to work mostly in the daytime. There were only two or two night pilots in the regiment, and to fly not the nearest light to Constanta. Well, I was calm about the old men. They could fly to America at night on their long-range Il-4 bomber. And suddenly you can imagine a young Lieutenant Nikolai Grinin came to me in the evening. We have one of those, Comrade Regiment Commander. Permission to address you. Permission granted. May I go to Constanta at night? It's a pity to offend the guy. I see he's eager to fight. But I'm to authorize him. According to my information, Grinin didn't fly at night. As gently as possible, I explain it all to him. And he said to me, You have inaccurate information, Comrade Kompolka. No, so. I was flying a naval bomber at night, so I thought about it, thought about it, and decided I'd take my chances. And how did it go? Yesterday I presented him with the Order of the Red Star. The guy did a great job. He climbed into the thick of it, hit all the targets in cold blood. There was a glow over Constanza. The fire seemed to burn every, the black southern night and the clouds that descended on the city. Oil storages were burning, the fiery tornado was raging in the port and on the railroad lines filled with tanks with fuel for planes and tanks. Gestapo officials were rushing around the city. Kindamari tried to drive people to the fire, to at least somehow diminish the scale of catastrophically developing events. Hitlerites, even in a nightmare, could not have predicted what the morning of August 20 would bring them. For them it was really a black morning. As soon as dawn broke, Ten bombers of the 30th Air Regiment appeared over the city. Ten, not a hundred. With a sigh of relief in the headquarters of Hitler's air defense of Constanta, here did not know that the main purpose of the ten was to divert attention to themselves. The pilots courageously went for it, taking the fire of everything that could still shoot in the city and its vicinity. Hundreds of anti-aircraft machine guns and cannons rang out. Messers crawled out of underground hangars. The anthill stirred. And then from the sky came a terrible striking blow, to which no one could not counteract anything. On anti-aircraft installations, hangars, runways, command posts, air defense nodes bomb barrage fell. 
It was inflicted by Lieutenant Colonel N. Musatov with his eagles from the 13th Guards bomber. It was quite difficult to prevent Lieutenant Colonel to tickle Hitler's nerves, as he said before the flight. From the sky he was reliably covered by fighters of the 11th Guards bomber regiment. The fighters did not let any messer near the bombers. Here came my hour. Today it is possible to reveal what once confused all the cards to the enemy. Actually, Musatov and Denisov, with their guise only pierced the way of the main armada of retaliation. Air Division I Korzunov, 59 P2s, accompanied by two fighter guards regiments of the 6th and 43rd, inflicted according to the plan of the operation, the main decisive blow. Have you noticed, reader, what figures I'm already operating here? Could we have dreamed of anything like this in 1941 or 1942? The Soviet country forged its mighty air wings. The day before I had a memorable and joyful conversation with Korzunovs. I am leading the main forces of the strike, B as an order minted Ivan Igorovich. I won't get lost in Konstanta. After all, I bombed it on the first day of the war. Mouse many of you were there. What do you mean? Only four high-speed bombers del trills and I was only a squadron commander then. Today, the scale is different, but in such a complex operation, everything must be calculated down to the last detail. Nothing to forget, nothing to miss. We spent a long time working on the maps. In short, my system Dave, you allocate roles, so. Mine, you know, yours is special. You take your regiment. Let's call it group clearing the air. The goal is to hold back any enemy fighter forces if they appear over Constanza. In short, you're in charge of every P-2, so that no bastard can get near the bombers. When our yak broke away from the airfield and took a course for Romania, I was anxious at heart. Hell knows how many messes will meet us in the sky above Constanta, and how to make sure that none of them could not reach the machine's cause you know, sir. 58 P-2 had to work calmly. If the word calmly is even applicable to the war, I remembered another flight, tragic and heroic, 1943. The Nazis are in the Cuban in the North Caucasus. And suddenly, as often in war, there is this suddenly. Intelligence report. A lot of transports and ships of the enemy concentrated in Constanta. At that time, my friend, hero of the Soviet Union, Efremov, was driving the car to Constanta. I, with my guys, covered his torpedo carriers from the air. It was a sunny day. Nobody in Constanta could think that Soviet airplanes could appear over the city. And indeed, where could they appear from? The Soviet armies are somewhere out there in the Caucasus. The strike was made at a low angle from 30 meters. Two destroyers went down at once. Then Mikhail Benzanoshvili's quiet voice was heard in the helmet phones. I'm burning. Goodbye, friends. Mikhail took the plane, hit by anti-aircraft guns blazing out of the turn and directed it at the gas tanks. The terrible explosion, even our attacking machines were thrown aside. And there was more in that flight. The navigator Klyushkin's right eye was damaged by shrapnel. With his left hand he clamped the bleeding eye socket, and with his right hand he was carrying a navigator's pallet. And so we followed the old trail. Flames and smoke covered the sky of Constance. The first six dive bombers came down from the sky with a stone. Now, of course, it is impossible to see who of the familiar guys are sitting in the cabins. I know only the lead car is led by the regiment commander himself, my friend Stepan Kiryanov, and navigator Lavrenti Salita. But what kind of target have they chosen? I see. On the water surface, a destroyer is clearly visible. He is firing furiously at dive planes. Red, green, yellow trails stretch from the ship's side to the machines. Each one is death. Even the main caliber seems to be hitting. Well done, Stefan. Not a single plane from his six does not turn off course. They're climbing into the thick of it, as if they're insured against a frontal attack. If you get hit, you can't get the plane out of the dive. You'll hit the water. It is difficult to see everything at once, but still the main thing is visible. It seems that the operation is developing according to plan. P2 reorganize into a column of six. Separate. Everything is so planned. The strike on the base will be made from two di transmitted to his guys on the radio. Be especially attentive. In such a hell messes is nothing to sneak up unnoticed. I've got it. Four German fighters come out of the blue haze. Germans. I shout into the microphone, frantically thinking how to keep them away from the dive bombers. But I can already see. The reaction of the guys is lightning fuss. Four yak already fell back in front of the messes. 
cutting off the attacking bombers. Nothing to ever, my shout to the wingmen, attack their leading. I know the Germans do not like frontal attacks. I go head on. Something hits the plane, the axe shudders, and the messer moves away at the last second. Only for a moment I see his belly in the sight. My hand automatically presses the throttle. Yea, it's Susie the bastard. Again I throw the car into the attack. No, there's no need to shoot. Messer with a roar escapes from the battlefield, but it is unlikely to reach their run. Too thick plume of smoke stretches behind the fighter. I look around anxiously. Where are the others? The unthinkable merry-go-round in the air is over. We're off, comrade commander. I hear the mocking voice of Sasha Volkov in my headphones. Where to? God knows where. They've completely fled. One, I think, was hit. It was burning. Well done, guys. And then I immediately realize. I'm not in the mood for praise now. And I'm adding sternly. Watch the air carefully. That the sky above Constanza was already all ours. Not a single messer risked to appear over the city. So the air clearing group accomplished its mission. The most unbelievable things happen in war. If you tell them, they won't believe it. But here in Constance, too many people witnessed a truly extraordinary stroke of luck. When I laid the turn and again glimpsed at the destroyer, at first I did not understand what was happening to her. Its deck seemed to be intact, but the flames were flying out of the sides. It was necessary to happen such a thing. The bomb hit right in the pipe of the destroyer and safely followed in the boiler room. There it exploded. That's why this ship smoked so unusually. No one, of course, on such accuracy bombing did not pretend to such accuracy bombing, but what was, was. At the steep bend I had time to glimpse the bay again. Flames and smoke enveloped the cruiser Dutchka. Well done, guys. Only later at the airfield I learned that it was the work of Anatoly Brilliantov's dive bomber. Chetting bombed, the dive bombers began to go to the sea. But I knew this was not the end. It is. We throw fighters in the height. We see the 29th Air Regiment under Alexei T. Setsurin approaching Constanta. Now everything will start all over again. When our regiment came to the sea, my heart H. One of the P-2 bombers frantically tried to gain altitude. But the crew, apparently, nothing worked. The airplane was obviously hit. Some seconds passed and, having raised to the sky cascades of splashes, P-2 sat down on the water. We barraged over the crash site in case someone from the crew managed to save himself. And indeed the car is holding on the water, and on the wing of it. People? Nee. Keep an eye on the air. Keep the enemy out, I ordered. And fuel was already literally in short supply. We breathed a sigh of relief when we saw that the guys successfully reached the shore. Here they took shelter in the reeds. Later we learned that the pilots safely left the enemy. By night from the headquarters of the Air Force went to Moscow Cipher. The task is accomplished. Disabled shipyard. According to preliminary data sunk more than 30 enemy ships. Burned ammunition depots and gasoline storage tanks. And a call from the commander of the Black Sea Fleet Air Force, General Amachenkov, puzzled me. Mikhail Vasilievich, by the morning of August 25, prepare two yaks. We'll fly together with you two on reconnaissance of Hitler's airfields located in Romania. I was taken aback. How to, comrade commander, we can do such a reconnaissance with our own forces. Why do you have to fly personally? Especially two of us. We'll run into a messer. I'm not worried about myself, I immediately clarified. But you're the commander. I want to see everything myself. I was really worried. Anything happens in war. I didn't want my commander to be shot down in front of my eyes. A fight is a fight, especially if suddenly we are attacked, say, a dozen messers. Then maybe we should take an escort group. It's not necessary. Emma Chenkov cut off. What kind of reconnaissance in a cluster? You also raise the whole regiment, and the two of us will do everything neatly. I knew Vasily Vasilievich's personal courage, but I still stuck to my opinion. The risk was unjustified, but an order is an awe. It must be obeyed. 25th Emma Chenkov arrived at the airfield. I'll be leading. You covering. Maybe still take at least a six escort. I did not persist. No. And if? The battle. And we have a different task. Our goal is reconnaissance. We'll fight back, we'll give full throttle and go home. Well, I sighed. Then let's fly. Don't sigh, Mikhail Vasilievich. 
Yermashenkov patted me on the shoulder. I take all the responsibility on myself. It's above the front line we were shelled. True, the fire was not very strong and aimed. Only once the commander's car shook a little. What I experienced at that moment is better not to remember. We're flying deep into enemy territory. Until my eyes hurt, I look at the sky. God forbid messes. And I'm responsible for the commander's head. And I am even more confirmed in my personal opinion. We are doing a foolish thing, to observe the situation in the air on the left, right up ahead and behind the course. My two eyes are clearly not enough. After the flight my neck was sore, I was twisted to hell. From the sunny side I notice a group of airplanes. We've waited. I want to radio to the general and sigh with relief. I recognize the yaks, probably from a neighboring regiment. We passed over the enemy airfields at a strafing run. Now we can go back. How we flew over the front line, how we landed. I remember, vaguely, my nerves were on edge. I had never felt such a feeling in any battle. Smiling Ermashenkov comes up. I told you everything would be all right. By the way, I noticed he leaned towards me. The airfields are almost empty. So the Germans are pulling their air force to Germany. And what is this? Hmm, suddenly asks the general, pointing with his hand at the takeoff field. I see yaks coming in for landing. Where from? Uh, I don't know, comrade general. I'll ask Chief of Staff Lokinsky. And then it hit him. That's whose yaks I noticed in our flight on the sunny side. What mission were they flying? Ermachenkov comes up, smiling slyly. Lokinsky hesitates for a minute, then waves his hand hopelessly. Okay, you'll find out anyway. I heard Comrade Regiment Commander your conversation with the commander, and on my own responsibility decided to ensure you. You know the Hitlerites as habits. They like to attack from around the corner, in a cluster on single planes. So I sent an escort group, part of the first squadron commanded by Captain Grib. Emakenkov turned black, then suddenly laughed. They spent devils. Well, thank you for your concern. He firmly shook hands with Lokinsky. On August 24, Royal Romania left the fascist bloc. In the morning, the purpose of our reconnaissance with Ermachenkov became clear to me. Huge forces of our aviation were preparing to relocate to Romanian airfields. Airstrikes of the Black Sea Fleet broke the main enemy forces on the coast. The troops of the 3rd Ukrainian Front were entering Romania. Romanian soldiers did not want to fight with us. In those days, Lukinsky's chief of staff was summoned by the commander. Say mood in the Romanian troops, I see, he said in our favor. Try, using this circumstance with your own forces to occupy the airport of Constanta and Mamea's airfield. But let's try. Lukinsky and Grib went to Constanta with a group of cars. They approached the city at the lowest altitude. Not a single shot was fired from the ground. What a thing. Grib stretched out, as if the war... What are you talking about? Asked on the radio wingman. With Constanza, it seems everything is in order. Scout Mamai's airfield. The aviation school is based there. Let's see how we will be met there. Romanians or Hitlerites, just in case in the trunk of each airplane, the commissar still at his airfield planted a machine gunner. These were our own motorists. There was no telling what could happen in an unfamiliar land, and even behind the front line. And here's Mamai under the wing. I'm going to land. I'll find out what's going on. The rest to cover from the air. Transmitted on the radio grib and released the chassis of the car. Landed. Automatic rifleman at the ready. Slowly stretches minutes of languid waiting. But here from the building comes out of the man goes to the plane. Now allow me to introduce myself. Lieutenant Colonel of the Romanian Air Force. The head of the school. Match motor Pleased to meet you. They jumped to the ground. A group of Romanian pilots approached. And evasiation. And everything becomes clear. We are welcomed as friends. Grib waving his hand. Yak, go to land. Chief of Staff Lokinsky assessed the situation at the airfield from the air and, convinced that everything is in order, went back, reporting to me about the completion of the task of the commander. On the next day, August 30, our entire regiment flew to Mamai airfield. It was the first flight in the whole war when we knew that we would be met not with fire but with friendly smiles. It was a golden autumn in Romania, quiet and clear. In the mornings, through the misty haze, Constanza could be seen as a lilac silhouette.
Above it, there were no more black clouds of smoke, no more fires, no more anti-aircraft shell explosions. Then we felt for the first time that the war was coming to an end. And a few days later we went into battle again, now in the Bulgarian sky, for the liberation of Varna and Ber. Here the war ended for the pilots of our regiment and for me. It's a terrible war which took so many dear lives, but without them there would not have been this end. Yes, for some of us the war ended earlier, for others later. On the Danube and over Vienna ended the combat path of my good friend, hero of the Soviet Union Ivan Timofeyevich Marchenko. In the attestation given to him by the command, it was said 165 air reconnaissance missions were conducted by a naval pilot during the years of war. He shot down seven enemy planes, destroyed dozens of tanks, vehicles, wagons with military property. It was already close to the time of post-war silence when Ivan Timofeyevich's letter came to us from Vienna. Dear Black Sea friends, battle companions, I am writing this letter from here, from distant Vienna, in the capital of Austria. The battles have already gone far away. My heart is happy that we are here in the active flotilla, but at the same time we miss our native side. I want to write to you, dear Black Sea friends, that you use every minute of training and combat training for further improvement of your skills. Do not think that the enemy has become weaker to resist, that he is fleeing from the battlefield and that you can rest on your laurels not at all. Study harder, master the experience of past battles, learn to fight over the sea, closely cooperate with the ships of the native Black Sea Fleet. I dare to assure you, dear friends, that we who participated in the battles for the liberation of the Caucasus Crimea, cleansing of Romania and Bulgaria from the enemy, will not shame the honor of the aviation of the Black Sea Fleet and we will not shame this honor. During the war pilots of our regiment did not fulfill any tasks, but what they were entrusted with now, the responsibility that fell on the shoulders of each pilot was incomparable to anything. At the very beginning of the conversation, the commander of the Air Force, looking around at all present, strictly, everything I'm going to say now is the most important state secret, and you are responsible for its safety. Not a single person not involved in the operation must not know anything and not guess about anything. The introduction didn't bode well. The other day in the Crimea in Yalta, a conference of the heads of the three Allied powers, it will be attended by Stalin, Roosevelt, Churchill. You do not need to explain the importance of this conference. Commander with a moment of silence. It is possible that Hitler's intelligence will know something, and from the Nazis can expect any mischief. In short, you must ensure the normal operation of the Yalta Conference, cover it from the air. Not a single German airplane can appear over Crimea during the conference. Is the task clear? Was it necessary to ask about something? Each commander perfectly understood what a huge responsibility falls from this minute on each of them. Before two squadrons of Yaks flew on order to Cape Chersonese to cover the work of the conference from the sea. The pilots had time to get acquainted with their American and British colleagues who arrived at one of the Crimean airfields. Vasily Gusakov and his comrades were invited to the foreign machines. At the end of the airfield stood the British squadron of Mosquito, opposite American lightings. The four-engine passenger airplane on which Roosevelt flew was in the middle of his squadron. Exactly the same position was Churchill's car. They are standing, winked Kologrovov Gusakov, Standing to use here to. They laughed. Only they knew what lies behind this word, standing. The fact is that the Allied pilots from the first day of their stay at the Soviet airfield began early morning training. They would have practiced over the airfield. God be with them. Who would have prevented them? The trouble was that the heavy machines, widening and widening the radius of flight, were almost at a breakneck speed over the roofs of the houses of the surrounding towns and villages. South, the windows were shaking. No one could literally find a place for themselves. The flights began at dawn and often dragged on into the night. We began to look for a diplomatic way out. The commander of the Black Sea Fleet Air Force, General Ermachenkov, found it. In the afternoon, he called the regiment commander to his office. You see what is being done. He nodded toward the window, behind which could be heard the roar of heavy machines starting and landing. People have neither sleep nor peace. We have to end it, somehow diplomatically, and I've got a thought. During these flights you should fly a couple of your hawks and show the Allies a super high aerobatics, so to speak, as an exchange of experience. Is it convenient, Comrade General? 
there will be some more complications in the higher spheres. What does higher spheres have to do with it? Do it. Yes. The high honor to show the Allies super high pilotage fell to the share of Kologrivov, Gusakov, and Stepan Petrov. As soon as dawn broke and the Allied planes began to warm up their engines, a trio of yaks swept over the airfield in a whirlwind on a strafing flight. Exactly over the airfield they made a loop, released the landing gear, and landed not far from the British and American machines. And Mikhenkov approached the pilots. Is the task clear? Yes. Good act. Don't spare airplanes. Show us what you can do. Yes, don't spare planes. Me While Kologrivov, Gusakov, and Petrov were on the ground, to them began a pilgrimage of Allied pilots. They looked at the Yarkis with curiosity. Questions came in hail. What maneuverability? Armament? Which airplane is better? Yak-3 or Mi-109? Would you be able to fly on our machines? They obviously liked the answers. There are no better fighters now than the Yak-3. We can fly on your machines even now. Would you be able to conduct a conditional air battle with us? Right away. But we have heavy machines. We'd be at a disadvantage. We'll change the balance of power. Against one Yak, you'll have four of your best machines. However, we'll accept your terms. There were no more questions. So that the day after tomorrow from the morning pilots and technicians from Mosquito and lighting settled down at their cars. Everyone was waiting with interest for the performance. To Karivov and Gusak, to pilot directly over the Allied planes, to leave the figures at a height of 5,100 meters, to take off between the rows of machines of the British and Amer Gusakov took off, gained speed, went exactly along the wall of mosquito and lightings, and at a height of only 50 meters began dizzying aerobatics. Loop Immerman with a half-barrel flip Ranversman, ascending corkscrew, the usual corkscrew, combat turn, sometimes it seemed to Vasily that from such overloads Yak is about to fall apart. He truly did not spare the airplane. See, same thing does, Kologrov. He goes into the attack, at an altitude of 400 meters, a deep turn. Smoky jets of torn air burst from the planes and stabilizer, and immediately six barrels in a row. Hat something unimaginable was happening on the grounds. Hats and helmets were flying up. Allied pilots whistled, clapped, yelled. The commander congratulated the pilots. Now they'll calm down. They had one argument. We're practicing piloting techniques. After today, Ermachenkov smiled. They are unlikely to demonstrate this technique so zealously. A day happened, Ada was established at the airfield. Flights of Allied machines began to take place on pre-designed routes and at certain times, and over Yelta and around it, continuously patrolled our yaks. Everything was thought out to the last detail. The air shield created by the regiment was absolutely impenetrable for any armada of enemy planes. The Yelta conference was covered from the air absolutely reliably, and in the moments when the yak covered Yelta from the air, in Levadia Palace, Roosevelt asked Stalin to talk about the situation on the Soviet-German front formed by that time. Stalin suggested that Army General Antonov, Deputy Chief of the Red Army General Staff, satisfy the Allies' curiosity. Antonov proudly report. By February 1, that is, for 18 days of the offensive, the Soviet troops in the direction of the main strike advanced up to 500 kilometers. Thus, the average rate of advance was 25-30 kilometers per day. The Soviet troops reached the Oder, in the area from Kustrin and to the south, and seized the Silesian industrial area, the main routes connecting the East Prussian grouping of the enemy with the central regions of Germany were cut. Thus, except for the Kurland grouping, the enemy grouping in East Prussia was isolated. A number of separate German groups were surrounded and destroyed. Strong long-term defensive positions of the Germans in East Prussia, on the Königsberg and Letzen directions, were broken through. Forty-five German divisions were defeated, and the enemy suffered losses. About 100,000 prisoners about 300,000 killed, in total up to 400,000 people. Churchill listened, frowning. For some reason, after Antonov's report, his mood had clearly soured. And here it came, the long-awaited peaceful, quiet time. But not for me. I stayed in the army. I graduated from the General Staff Academy, was in various command positions in the Air Force. During my life, I flew 35 types of airplanes. 
I started with machines that had a speed of up to 100 kilometers per hour and ended up on jets with a speed of 2400 km per hour and a height of 22,000 meters. But that was another life. A life beyond that fiery frontier, which meant our great victory over fascism. If fate had granted me my youth again and put a choice in front of me, I would not hesitate to become a pilot again. And not at all, because this profession is better for me than any other. It is like a first love that never fades. Whoever at least once experienced the happiness of huge speeds, high skies, happiness of air battles, where seconds decide victory or defeat, will never forget it. They may say it's a heroic profession, but is a soldier going with a grenade to a tank less heroic, or a sailor from the Marines fighting to the last bullet near Odessa or Sevastopol? No, the concept of a pilot like an ordinary soldier first of all means work. Yes, the Soviet aviation did a good job in the Great Patriotic War. During its years, our pilots made about four million airplane sorties, out of one ten thousand airplanes lost by Hitler's Germany and its European allies, only Soviet pilots destroyed 55,000. It is difficult to list all the heroes, all the feats of air warriors. Heroism during the war was massive. After all, only among aviators more than 200,000 people were awarded government awards, and 2420 of them became heroes of the Soviet Union. But none of them, going to the feet, did not think about glory. We were doing the common military work of the people, and we are happy that the victory was formed from our efforts. But still, what is a feat? Recently I received a letter from one of my readers, a worker of Magnitogorsk Alexei Stroganov. I understand that you and your comrades lived by self-denial, but then there was a war, and who thought then about personal? Everything was subordinated to one goal goal, to win, to win by all means. And now it's peaceful days, I'll be thirty soon. And what feat can be accomplished in these years, when you become more mature, maybe you will be entrusted with more responsible deeds. But before thirty, the personality is only forming. It's at thirty that the personality is just forming. Vieji dot angry, I wanted to refer to well-known examples. Gaida, Zoya Kosmodemianskaya, Vitaly Bonova, Kresnodonsi, Stakhanov, Ketogorova, Mamlaka, hundreds of feats performed by the young, young in battle and labor. But I am a pilot. I think that with this book I essentially answered Alexei's question. After all, about whom I told here, was far under thirty and only a few passed over this age? And yet I will tell about one more guy. In his questionnaire it was written, Surname Franz, name Timur, year of birth, 1923, time of joining the Komsomol, 1938, that's all. The point, Alexei, is not the age. The point is what goal a person sets for himself in life and how persistently he achieves it. In September 1941, he graduated with honors from the Kaczynsk Red Banner Military Aviation School, named after Myasnikov. Myasnikov. I almost didn't catch Timer when we brought our yaks to Kacha, but everyone in our regiment knew about his feet. Here, I would like to switch to the language of documents, so that no one could say that I embellished or exaggerated something. A. Klemente Fremovich wrote in 1940, Timur wrote to his father's friend K. Voroshilov, If I could only describe to you, what was my feeling when I first went up in the air? What artillery? Now I already have two hours and forty-four minutes. Flying time. Our instructor is wonderful. Lieutenant Korshinov, he graduated from Kache with honors and already has three graduates. The very height of flights and a damn day off, and tomorrow a new trouble. The whole squadron is flying and our group has theoretical classes and I'm dying to fly, it's a shame. But in general I'm terribly pleased. The training, even theoretical, is very interesting. Now I have eight independent flights. The training is excellent and provided with everything necessary. So there is nothing to say, everything is in our hands, but so far everything is all right with the studies. Although we can't say that the theory we are taught is nothing. The pro, although compressed, but in terms of volume is not inferior to any program of any aviation school. At least all the necessary subjects are taught here thoroughly and in detail. However, admittedly, I thought it would be much easier. It's not that the subjects are difficult, but the lack of time. Literally every minute you have to use and not just use, but try to use as rationally as possible. You spin, you spin, you can barely keep up. However, now I am so involved that I have time to allocate 15-20 minutes every day. I decided to take up French, so as not to forget. And the people at school are wonderful. 
The guys are simple, cheerful, cheerful. In general, the people are dashing, fighting. In short, my environment to my liking, to our great joy. Our school from now on does not produce more pilots neither on I-15 nor on seagulls. Training will now be done exclusively on the I-16. In general, from the very first days, I liked the I-16 airplane in all respects much better than the I-15 airplane. And the main thing is that this airplane does not allow any liberties in training. A very strict machine, you can even say, a somewhat difficult machine. It is a very strict machine. One can even say, a somewhat difficult machine. Terzansky, it requires addressing only. Another letter. You ask me about my mood. To this I can answer firmly that my mood is excellent. For every day I am becoming more and more sure that no other military profession is comparable to my profession. The third, connected with the beginning of the war. The flight training course has now been expanded. Formation flying, aerial firing and air combat have been introduced. We hope that now we will be immediately sent to the front and not somewhere to train. I am seriously now most of all afraid that when I finish the school, I will fall under the guardianship of some superiors and, for goodness sake, I will be stuck for half a year, mastering the material part or under some other pretext. The school was graduated with honours, a testation of the command, devoted to the cause of the party and the socialist motherland, politically and morally stable, can keep military secrets, general development is excellent, politically well developed, works hard to improve his theoretical knowledge in the field of military literature and foreign languages, his comrades is sociable, enjoys authority among them, physical development is excellent, polite in treatment, warned, energetic, decisive, initiative, persistent and unwavering in carrying out his decisions, he mastered the flight program well, fixing excellent, in flight training overestimation of his strength in mastering the airplane was observed. He was not afraid to do any experiments on the airplane and was not averse to doing something improper. There was a case of overfulfillment of the task in the zone for which he was suspended from flying. After that I flew normally. During his flight training it turned out that he needed strict control over piloting techniques. He passed the theory and flight practice test with honours. Cadres of the Air Force corresponded with the use of a fighter pilot in the units of the Air Force of the K, with the award of the rank of lieutenant. P.E. For Roshilov himself told about these days that followed Timur's graduation from the school. I remember an episode from Timur's life, which I cannot forget, when the war began and Timur had already graduated from the Kachin military pilot school. I met him grown up in Kubishev, where at that time many government institutions were transferred. The meeting was pleasantly touching. He briefly reported on his graduation from flight school and said that he was now going to the Air Force headquarters for distribution, i.e. for assignment to active military units. A few days later we left by airplane for Moscow. We flew together and he talked about one thing all the way. He asked me to help him to go to the front as soon as possible. After that, Tamir, not being assigned to the service, came to see me several times and, despite my busyness, started talking about the same thing, about speeding up his dispatch to the active part. I promised to find out this issue to help him. I made phone calls to some of his superiors, but somehow in the flow of various cases the issue dragged on. Timir never stopped reminding me of his request, but now he was already excited and nervous. You, Clement Efremovich, obviously do not trust me, but you knew my father well. I want to resemble him in everything. I'll beat my enemies skillfully, mercilessly. I won't spare my own life. Please arrange for me to be sent to the front as soon as possible. I felt sorry for Timur, soothed him as best I could, and said that I would call again and again to whom I should. Please call me Kliment Euphremovich, only as soon as possible. You know I'm afraid that the war may end at any moment, and it will happen without my participation, without my personal. At least one air fire strike on the fascist bastards, on this despicable enemy of our motherland of our people. To be afraid of the sudden end of the war, dear Timur, you cannot, it should be happy, me, I answered him. But, unfortunately, the end of the war is not yet visible. It is only flaring up. Timur began to assure me that he agreed with me, that that was why he needed to be in the first ranks of the defenders of the motherland. That was Timur Franz, a brave and fearless young man. He honorably kept his word he to beat the enemy, not sparing his own life, and died a hero's death reflecting a raid of superior forces of enemy aviation. How it happened, 
is told in the report of the command, which presented him posthumously to the title of Hero of the Soviet Union, 17.1, 1942, when performing a combat mission to cover his troops in the area northeast of the town of Staraya Russa at 12.15. Fifteen men, at an altitude of 900 meters, paired with an experienced pilot junior Lieutenant Shutov, met four enemy aircraft type Mi-109, boldly and decisively attacked this group of enemy aircraft. The attack was daring and unexpected for the enemy. One Mi-109 airplane was shot down. During the attack, three more Mi-109s came to the aid of the Nazis. Having numerical superiority and speed advantage, the enemy managed to split the brave pair of Fr Franz's plane was attacked by three Mi-109s. Comrade Franz used all his firepower and in this unequal battle died a hero's death. Lieutenant Franz was buried with military honors in the cemetery in the village of Krestsey, Leningrad region. For the exemplary fulfillment of the command's tasks at the front against the German invaders and for the courage and heroism shown at that, Lieutenant Franz was presented to the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. This is what a man can do, Alexei, even at the age of 19. A real cause and purpose inspire a man, raise him to the feet. The sky, it will beckon me too, even at my last frontier, as long as the eyes see and the heart beats. See, one of my pilot friends wrote to me, the world must be protected. People will not forget that tens of thousands of fascist vultures found death in the Soviet sky during the Great Patriotic War. In the name of the peaceful skies of the planet, supersonic missile-carrying aviation stands guard over the blue frontiers. The best sons of the Soviet people who are entrusted with the latest technology protect the peaceful skies of the motherland. Now you can no longer distinguish the boundaries between the fifth and sixth oceans, the atmosphere and space, into which we are invading pilots and cosmonauts. Once I had a chance to talk to our famous cosmonaut, hero of the Soviet Union Alexei Leonov, Yes, our blue planet floating in space is beautiful with a bright, majestic beauty, Leonov reflected. Earth is beautiful and yet strikingly small in the immense ocean of stars. Spaceships fly around it in just an hour and a half. From orbital heights you can look at all of Europe at once. The Scandinavian peninsula is swinging in the porthole on the left side, to the north the shores of Norway, the Baltic Sea, Leningrad, Riga, Behind England and Ireland, London, to the right you can see the Adriatic, the Pyrenees, the Black Sea, Italy, and ahead on the course of movement, our dear Moscow. But not only blooming arable land and verdant gardens can be seen from orbital heights. Like black grins, NATO military ranges are gaping, military plants are smoking, and one can't help thinking about the fact that only in our century Europe has gone through two terrible wars. How many millions of people died in these wars? How many millions of those who could have lived, enjoyed life and served humanity? High ideals? Such a thing must never happen again. People can and must live in peace and friendship. The guarantee of the world's future prosperity is the struggle for peace, for the unity of all progressive forces space is being explored for man, and in the name of man, in the name of improving life for all earthlings. That is why man bears full responsibility for what is happening and will happen on his planet for the future of his descendants. His earth is like a spaceship traveling in the world's space. It can and must expand the boundaries of the inhabited world, so the seeds of reason and goodness in the solar system and beyond this great mission of man-creator can be solved only through the unity of all progressive forces on Earth. I see young guys at the consoles of spaceships going into the starry distances. This is the continuation of our road. The road to unprecedented victories. Every time I visit Sevastopol, first of all I come to you, Primorsky Boulevard. Here, at the monument to the lost ships, the waves crash against the stones with hissing and rumbling. You breathe easily and detach. Sea is visible up to the horizon, and grey and pepper cruisers go to the distant southern seas, and the Konstantinovsky Ravelin, in terrible unhealed scars from the war, looks at you with dark cavities of loopholes. The wind beats on the stones of the Ravelin. It's like the echo of a battle that has died down. And so everything would seem peaceful. The bottomless sky, the waves sparkling with thousands of fiery splashes, and the soul-stealing smell of blossoming acacia trees. But when I look at you, Ravelin, the past comes alive at once. Silence no longer exists. I see the flames of fires over Sevastopol, 
and in my brain the rumble of explosions, volleys of airplane guns, the howling of messes. And how can I forget you, Revlin? After all, it was you we attacked with Yasha Makiev during our last flight to Sevastopol before we left the city. You were already in enemy hands, Ravelin. Then Yasha and I noticed a dagger beam of searchlight from Konstantinovsky. The beam stretches to where our transport plane should arrive any minute now. Maybe the very last of those that will be able to make their way to Chersonesos to pick up the wounded. I remember with what fury I pressed the throttle. The beam had to go out. It had to go out by all means. Twice I dive-bombed that damned searchlight, and twice it came back to life. So I cursed both God and the devil and did not know what to do. It was night and yet I risked, though it was almost suicide, to enter the ravelin shaving from the land. Those seconds will not be forgotten. Both gasoline and ammunition were running out, repeating the attack was out of the question. From a minimum distance I hit the searchlight from the cannon. The beam went out. How many nerves and desperate tension you cost us, that damned searchlight. How can I forget you, Ravelin? You were defended to the last bullet, and the last wounded soldier of the garrison was hanged by the fascists on your balcony. The paths of war are inexplicable. The whole Sevastopol was razed to the ground, but this balcony was preserved. It is still clearly visible from the boulevard in good weather. Here on the boulevard, at the monument to the sunken ships, when we entered the city, smoked Hitler's landing barge. I sit on the boulevard until evening, listening to the splash of the waves and remember, remember, time is merciless, and the war hardship makes itself known. Many are already missing in our ranks. Recently, in Moscow died Colonel Hero of the Soviet Union Alexei Antonovich Gubery, died in Leningrad our Commander Colonel General of Aviation Vasily Vasilievich Ermachev. There also passed away a teacher of the Naval Academy, Hero of the Soviet Union Colonel Alexeev. Three years ago we lost a brilliant pilot, Colonel General of Aviation Hero of the Soviet Union Ivan Agarovich Korzunov, and his more than 300 combat sorties, when he personally destroyed 25 enemy ships, became a legend. My friend Mikhail Mikhailovich Kologrivov, a fearless air fighter, is gone. Everything is already becoming a circle of front friends, and that's why every message from them is a great joy. With those who live in Moscow, we often meet. With Konstantin Dmitrievich Denisov, Meva, General of Aviation, Hero of the Soviet Union. He works at the General Staff Academy. With Nikolai Alexandrovich Nomov, Hero of the Soviet Union, Lieutenant General of Aviation in Reserve. With Ivan Stepanovich Lubimov, Hero of the Soviet Union, Major General of Aviation. He is a candidate of military sciences, works at the General Staff Academy. With my close friend, Miron Efimov, hero of the Soviet Union. And when one of us receives letters from our combat friends in the fiery Sevastopol sky, the phones in our apartments are not silent till night. Our wonderful scout hero of the Soviet Union, Ivan Belozerov, sends news about his successes. He works in Simferopol in the civil air fleet. In Guta Lives, regimental engineer, lieutenant colonel in reserve, Fyodor Vasilievich Makov. In Odessa, regiment commander Lukinsky. In Rostov, Reserve Colonel Hero of the Soviet Union Grib. There in the Civil Air Fleet works Moskalenko. In Leningrad, Ivan Ivanovich Saprikin. In Kharkov, Navigator Mikhail Tala. In Nikolaev, Ivan Konstantinovich Naik. In Eve Pretoria, Hero of the Soviet Union Ugraf Rezev. You meet a friend on the street, in modest clothes in summer, in a white shirt. Only on the day of victory and solemn occasions they put on orders. And people hurrying on their business do not guess next to whom they just passed. After all, Konstantin Stepanovich Alexeev made more than 500 combat sorties. On his combat account, 19 downed enemy planes. Eight of them at night. Konstantin Denisov shot down 13 airplanes. Nikolai Alexandrovich Naumov, 7. Mikhail Ivanovich Grib made 510 combat sorties, destroyed 16 fascist planes. Dmitry Alexandrovich Starikov, respectively, 521. This list would be endless, if I would list now all fate has scattered us all over the earth, but till the last breath we will be faithful to our front Sevastopol brotherhood. Our sons are growing up, and each of us dreams that they will be like those whose will, character, courage are united by one concept, Sevastopol resident. Yes, Sevastopol is the word of the oath, to loyalty to the motherland, to the people, to the party. 
Recently, I received a big letter from Pilot Dasily Gusakov, who bravely fought during the war in our regiment. At the beginning, as it often happens in the correspondence of combat friends, there were frontline memories. Then, poems. They were called a precept to my son. There were... Tell me, father, asked once a son. You fought, of course, not alone. And where are your comrades now? After all, many will not rise from the ground. No, they will. Are they dead? They're in the ranks while the fighting is going on. They're with you and with me. They go out bravely to the last battle. It's against fascism. And while the earth is bleeding, they're in the fight. My comrades. And in the hour of need, you'll feel their strong shoulder. In any trouble, they will not let you down. They'll save you from death. They'll save you from the fire. I know it. I've seen it myself many times. They'll die, but they'll follow orders. I wish you could be like them. I wish you'd hold your line to the death, too. That's why you'll always remember. And everyone gives the best flowers. And songs of immortality are sung. These lines moved me deeply. Can a father give better instructions to his son, a young warrior? Yes, many will not rise from the earth. Fearless Ostrakov remained in the land of Sevastopol forever. Spirov, one of the first who brilliantly opened the combat account of pilots on the Black Sea, remained near Novorossiysk. The navigator Ivan Ivanovich Protasov, who died near Kerch, will not stand up. Naum Zakharovich Pavlov, who forever went to the blue sky above two apps, will not rise. My dear friend Ivan Silin will not rise, a pilot of unbridled courage. Already after the war I came once to Evatoria. I walked down the street and met a man. I don't believe my eyes. Ivan himself is heading towards me. It's crazy, flashed through my head. Silin is not there, and it cannot be. What is it? The living Silin was standing next to me, but for some reason he looked at the aviation general who was looking at him so intently. Excuse me, what's your last name? I made up my mind. Silin. What are you saying? It's, it's unbelievable. I guess my face reflected such confusion that Silin laughed. And you, by any chance, are not Avdiv. Avdiv. Then everything is clear. I'm the son of Ivan Silin, your friend. Everyone says I'm a copy of my father. Are you free now? Yes. But please come to my place. You'll be a dear guest. We sat up with him till midnight. I told him about my father, about a distant past he didn't know. He told me about the sea and ships. He's in the Merchant Navy. Do you like it? You bet. I love it when there's a wide horizon ahead. I love the high sky. It's great. The sun inherited the anxiety. Sevastopol remembers its heroes. On Nakimov Square, along the supporting wall of the Sailors' Boulevard, stands a monumental bas-relief dedicated to the heroic feat of the participants of the defense of Sevastopol in 1941-1942. It was erected to the 50th anniversary of the Great October Revolution. The authors of the monument project, sculptor V. Yakovlev and architect I, Fialko sought to convey the greatness of the feat committed by Sevastopol residents. In the center of the composition depicts a warrior with a machine gun, in an irrepressible rush rushing at the enemy, dragging his comrades with him. He seems to grow out of the rocky Sevastopol land, which, like the mythological hero Antaeus, gives him the power to resist the three bayonets on the right symbolize the three attacks of the Nazis on the city. On the left are the dates of Sevastopol's defense in 1941-1942, the whole height of the memorial is a stylized anchor, a symbol of the sea city. On the granite slabs are carved the names of compounders, ships, units, and organizations of the city that took part in the defense of Sevastopol. The names of brave defenders awarded the title of hero of the Soviet Union. From October 29, 1941 to July 3, 1942, Sevastopol heroically defended the troops of the Sevastopol defensive area and the formations, ships, Units of the Black Sea Fleet, the Maritime Army, and the workers of the city. N.K. Bida N.V. Blagoviszenski, G.A.A. Volovic, G.K. Glavatsky, L.P. Golovin, A.M. Gushin, A. Eklakov, A.I. Kovtun, A. Seov, K. A. Laptev, A. Maptenkov, V. E. Esokin, A. Serena N. S. Okolov, A. S. Umakin. Vasily Tsibulko and political officer Nikolai Filchenkov repulsed the attacks of enemy tanks. 
they ran out of ammunition. The polytruck, strapped with grenades, threw himself under the tracks of the fascist tank. His example was followed by comrades. The attack was repulsed. The sailors were posthumously awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. Next to their names in the list on granite are the names of sailor Ivan Golubets, snipers Noah Adamia and Yudmila Pavlichenko, brave scout Maria Badar and dozens of others. In total, 54 people were honored with the highest military honor. on one of the granite slabs reads, the feats of Sevastopol, their selfless courage and selflessness, fury in the fight against the enemy will live in the centuries. They will be crowned with immortal glory. Golden Southern October, Sevastopol House of Officers, representatives of party, Soviet public organizations, and Sevastopol garrison gathered here to solemnly celebrate the 30th anniversary of the beginning of the heroic defense of Sevastopol in 1941-1942. Excitedly sounds a brief opening speech of the first secretary of the City Party Committee VI, Pashkov. The audience stood for a minute of silence for the heroes who fell in the battles for the freedom and independence of our motherland. Under the arches of the hall rumbles the sounds of the march. The gathered standing greeted the banner of the Red Banner Hero City of Sevastopol and the naval flag of the Red Banner Black Sea Fleet, the battle flags of units and ships blessed with the glory of victories in the battles for our homeland and the hero city of Sevastopol. The former commander of the cruiser Red Caucasus, retired Admiral M. Gushin, calls the numbers of units whose banners float through the hall. In the hall to the beat of drums and the sounds of pioneer horns, enters the column of young Leninists who came to congratulate the participants of the meeting. The address solemn minus, the address of veterans to the citizens of Sevastopol, to the sailors of the Black Sea. Cited voice reading it. Residents of the hero city of Sevastopol. Soldiers of the Red Banner Black Sea Fleet. To our dear battle comrades and friends. Our brothers, sisters and grandchildren. Together with the whole of our vast country. Together with you we celebrate the 30th anniversary since the beginning of the heroic defense of the legendary Sevastopol. Exactly 30 years ago, on the same October day, we stood up with weapons in our hands to defend Sevastopol. In the brutal struggle against fascist invaders, we had to close the embrasures of enemy bunkers and pillboxes with our bodies, to throw ourselves under the tracks of fascist tanks with bundles of grenades, to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, to go for an air ram. We looked death in the eye more than once. We fought as the Communist Party taught us, as our hearts and conscience told us, as our fathers and grandfathers, our mothers and wives told us to fight. In that harsh year, there was not a meter of land where the fires were not burning, where shots were not rattling, where bombs and shells were not bursting, where the blood of the defenders of the city was not spilled. Stones groaned, metal melted, but we stood. Then we thought about one thing to defend our beloved mandates, honor, freedom and independence, to defend the great conquests of October and we fulfilled our high duty to the party and the people. The military glory of Sevastopol traveled around the world. It entered the ages as a bastion of courage, steadfastness and bravery of the Soviet people. It rightfully took its rightful place in the wonderful constellation of such Soviet hero cities as Moscow, Leningrad, Kiev, Volgograd, Odessa and the heroic fortress Brest. In the days of the 30th anniversary of the beginning of the defense of Sevastopol, we bow our heads before the memory of fallen comrades, friends and comrades in arms and address. In the name of the fallen heroes, the pain of wounds, the sanctity of mass graves, we bequeath you the military glory of Sevastopol. Keep it in purity and honor. Increase it with feats of arms and labor. We bequeath it to you and signatures, a lot of signatures, after the festivities to Cape Kersenese. Almost thirty years have passed but the Caponias have been preserved, only overgrown with grass. At the monument to the fallen comrades, always flowers. We go down to the sea, we sit on the rocks, we stay silent for a long time. And then someone quietly begins our favorite guard song. It was composed in the fiery 1943 by Sergeant Boris Zubov. In the midst of battles and fires, and in the hum of native batteries, let us sing, my dear comrade, about the guard of our seas. We sing, and it seems to us that in the approaching twilight a signal rocket will flare up, and we will be lifted from the ground by a winged and formidable command. Yes, of the plains. The voice of one of the former conquerors came from across the Rhine. What did they propose? 
to drop an atomic bomb on us and declare a crusade against the Soviets and to anathematize us. The lessons of the war didn't serve them well, especially my old friend Erich von Manstein. It seems that there was no such gathering of revanchists where he would not have either made an inflammatory speech or not read his welcome message. Suddenly I opened the newspaper this morning. Von Manstein dead. Bonn, June 12, in Munich. Former Hitler Field Marshal Erich von Manstein has died at the age of 85. In the Nazi Wehrmacht, he commanded Army Group D, which unsuccessfully tried to break through to the encircled grouping of Hitler's troops near Stalingrad. In 1949, he was sentenced by the British Military Tribunal to 18 years in prison, but was released in 1952. In recent years, he lived in Bavaria, was a member of revanchist organizations. And immediately, like a stab, the feeling of that distant war day, when I flew with my partner on reconnaissance and without permission attacked and set fire to a boat near Yalta. Later it turned out that the commander of Hitler's group in the Crimea Manstein was on it. If we had known that, Field Marshal would not have had to write memoirs. My hand involuntarily reaches for the bookshelves. I take out Manstein's lost victories. I open on a familiar page, as it has a direct relation to them. I, in order to familiarize myself with the area, Writes von Manstein traveled along the southern coast to Balaclava on an Italian torpedo boat. I needed to establish to what extent the coastal road, which provided all the supply of the corpse, could be viewed from the sea and shot by corrected fire. On the way back to Yalta, a misfortune happened. Suddenly, bullets and shells whistled, crackled, snapped around us. Two fighter planes came down on our boat. As they came at us from the blinding sun, we did not notice them and the noise of the torpedo boat's powerful engines drowned out the noise of their engines. Within seconds, seven of the sixteen men on board were killed and wounded. The boat caught fire, which was extremely dangerous as the torpedoes on the sides could explode. It was a sad trip. An Italian non-commissioned officer was killed and three sailors were wounded. The chief of the Yelta port who accompanied us, Captain First Rank von Bredo, also died. At my feet lay my most faithful battle companion, my driver Fritz Nager. Well, everything has its end. Erich von Manstein also completed his earthly circle. He's gone. But how many poisonous seeds he threw on the post-war earth? Will something grow from them? However, there is no need to guess here. Groom misanthropy, revanchism, anger, distrust. It is about them, the field marshal's pupils, that the newspapers tell almost daily. Prague. The statement of the representative of the Foreign Ministry of the Czechoslovak SSR condemns the revanchist activities of the so-called Sudeten Germans. It is recalled here that this summer a meeting of this community was held in Munich, which was imbued with manifestations of hatred for the policy of peaceful coexistence and detente in Europe. It culminated in a large meeting on June 10, the 31st anniversary of the Lidice tragedy. The revanchist leaders used this gathering of evictees to pressure the federal government to pay great attention to their advice and position in implementing its policy of normalizing relations with the socialist countries. The statement notes that the political realism of the current West German government is understood by the people of the FERG, who do not agree with the support of the opposition parties of the FIAR and the Bavarian government for the hate-fueled Sudetene Germans compatriots. The International Federation of Resistance Movement participants has proposed a European meeting against neo-fascism. Such a meeting, the Federation says in its call, would be particularly relevant now, when the ideas of detente and cooperation are making their way in Europe. Under these circumstances, it is alarming that neo-fascist activity is on the rise in some Western European countries. Fascism is a threat to peace, the appeal notes. It is not by chance that those who want to return to the past are now using all means to fight against detente, cooperation. Indeed, the forces of extreme right-wing reaction are still raising their heads in some parts of Western Europe. The political labels under which they speak are different, but what they all have in common is their hatred of democracy and progress, and their desire to prevent the establishment of a lasting security system on our continent at all costs. The far-right forces refuse to recognize the existing borders in Europe, and in general, all the changes that have taken place here since the defeat of the fascist empires. Former SS men who managed to get away from the Eastern Front gather in Skendal. The SS is my ideal, an Italian terrorist who tried to blow up a crowded train on the Riviera told investigators, my goal was to provoke a state of tension, of anxiety, 
so that in the end the military would come to restore order and power, he said, saying he was a member of the legal neo-fascist party Italian social movement. Neo-fascist groups have more than ideological and political commonalities. A few years ago, at a meeting in Venice, the extreme right-wing forces of Western Europe created their own unified organizational center. The Roman bourgeois weekly Tempo calls it the Black International. The Western European press has repeatedly emphasized that the neo-fascists have large financial resources because their provocative activities are supported and encouraged by certain circles of big business, which need shock troops to fight the workers' movement, pushing the ultra to acts of terror against representatives of the working class and other progressive forces. Every man has memories in his soul that are especially sacred to him. They are not even memories, for memories are linked to the past. And what do you call the best in your destiny? The best is not because you had an easy and happy life. The way life is designed, the cloudless days fade into memory. Only those trials when you felt what you were worth, when you looked into the eyes of death and did not turn off the course, when you competed with it and won. When you are closest to the great common destiny of the people, and it always inspires a person and gives him the strength that in normal circumstances he might not have found in himself. And here, as if having gathered the will and courage of many and many, he discovers in himself secrets unknown to him before, becomes immeasurably higher than himself, ordinary, as if he measured himself with a different yardstick. This is what I think about, coming to you, Seaside Boulevard in Sevastopol, coming to you, Konstantinovsky Ravelin. After all, the glory of war never dies. It is like wings that lift a man to the feet, today, tomorrow, always.